Welcome, everyone, to uh, data visualization in the ArcGIS Maps SDK for JavaScript. Um, we'll go ahead and introduce ourselves. Uh, my name is Christian Ekinis. I uh, work on the Maps SDK. Um, also, Matt Viewer, Arcade projects, um, specifically on data visualization and smart mapping, um, and been doing that for almost 10 years now at Esri. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm Jeremy, um, CTO for web mapping and web app, geo web application technologies. And uh, yeah, I've been part of the JavaScript team from the beginning. And uh, the visualization has always been uh, my favorite part. Cool. Well, we have a lot of content um, to cover, so we're just going to dive into it. Um, just going to start off with a couple of things you can expect from this session. Um, you've probably made some visualizations or style data in the past and um, know how difficult it can be to get right. So we're going to not only show you how do you do this in the JavaScript SDK, but also how to do it in a meaningful way that really brings some insight to your data. Um, and also, hopefully, you walk away from the session um, really getting inspired um, by the various styles that you can use just visualizing one piece of data in your map. You can do it in many, many different ways, some of them better than others. And so hopefully you'll walk away with inspiration, but also tips on um, what you can do with your data. So first off, um, before we get into examples, we like to keep this pretty demo heavy. Um, but before we get into that, we're going to do an overview of the API specifically. So. Um, first off, what is it that you can visualize in our API? And it turns out that there's a whole lot you can do. Of course, we can do the where. So when you just plot points or draw points on a map, that's just telling you where something exists or happened. You can do what. Um, so categorical data fits into this, like points of interest in this example. Where are the hospitals? Where are the parks and the schools? Police stations? are typically done with some kind of unique value or unique uh, symbols. You can definitely do that. You can also visualize how much. And this can be done in a number of different ways, typically through visual variables, such as varying color, the hue or the lightness, um, based off a data variable. Um, also, size and opacity, you can do the same thing. Um, you can visualize when something occurred. So in this case, it's when was the incident reported? And not only that, but how many days has it been since that incident was resolved? And is it past due? So you could use a diverging color scheme to indicate whether you still have an open incident to take care of and it's been overdue. Or you can combine um, multiple visual variables into one visualization, such as this one, where we're looking at not only ocean temperature, but also the current, uh, the speed of the ocean currents, as well as the direction. Um, at this particular scale, you can't really get a sense of what the direction is, but as you zoom in um, on that example, you'll see um, arrows pointing in the direction. So um, the most basic part of uh, visualization with our SDK is the concept of symbology or symbols, particularly with vector data, and that's what we're focused on today. Um, so we have basic symbol primitives for getting started, simple line symbol, simple fill symbol, and simple marker symbol, typically each used for those geometry types that you see there, lines, polygons, and uh, points. Though you can use markers for your polygon visualizations as well. They, they can fit nicely as a centroid if that's how you choose to render polygons. Um, Fundamentally, the API is pretty simple for each of these. You don't, we don't get super complicated. You can define a color, an outline, a size where appropriate. Um, lines, you can do a little bit more with the, with the cap and join, um, basically where the different segments connect. Um, and we also offer different styles like hatches and, um, and uh, like dashes and dots for lines. Um, but that's about the extent of what you can do with simple symbology. But you can also do uh, picture symbols. Um, everything from trying to create this firefly example, um, where you get these glowing points, to an animated GIF to show maybe a moving hurricane along a path, 
uh, or picture fills where um, you can fill up uh, a polygon with a repeating picture such as like the swamp or the glacial examples here. And again, the, the API is pretty straightforward. You just point to an image um, URL, and then you may have other uh, properties such as specifying the height and width of those symbols. Um, in addition to those, you can get a lot more complicated too, and that's the, uh, the sim symbol. So um, sometimes people wanna have, there's, there's kind of two key things with the sim symbol, one, is it gives you a very high quality scalable symbol, um, whereas with images, uh, sometimes it doesn't scale well, so you can get a blurry image, but with a uh, sim symbol, it's a vector, um, so it scales really well and it's very crisp. You can also, you also have full control over the symbology model where you can define your own symbol layers, um, kind of in a, uh, it's the pro symbology model really, so in a similar way, if you're familiar with that process, you can create your own sim symbols. And also vary the, the properties of various primitives on those symbols with, with uh, primitive overrides. So you can actually vary the, the, the property based off a of data value. So in that example, you see there's two symbol layers. There's this outer ring and an inner dot that fills up that ring. The inner dot's data-driven, but the rest of it isn't. And you define that with, it's basically a black box API. We don't have um, APIs outside of just defining an object with, ver with a ton of nested properties to really get into the various um, uh, components of a SIM symbol. We do have a publicly documented SIM specification, which is linked here in the, in the slide deck. So if I um, open that up, I'm um, just gonna skip that. Um, it's documented on GitHub, so you can see all the various SIM properties here. We also have some pretty decent documentation in the JavaScript SDK that kind of points back to this doc as to the things that you can do with some helpful images. And um, built on top of the SIM symbology model are, is the concept of web style symbols. So to define, say, this tree symbol for this parks map, um, you would have to define individual vertices relative to an orig origin point to specify that tree shape. And that can be a very tedious process to do by hand, and certainly we don't expect people to actually do that um, unless they really want to have that full control programmatically. Um, but we do offer out-of-the-box uh, web styles that you can um, easily reference by name within the context of a style. So there's, there's a bunch that come out of the box, and we link to these in our documentation under our symbols and color ramps guide. And if you scroll through this page, you can see various things, like maybe you want a hospital symbol, and you can copy and paste that symbol into your code. Or if you wanna modify this a little bit, you can actually drill in to the individual, into the sim symbol itself, so these are the, the vertices I was talking about that would define that heart shape. Um, and you can make changes as, however you see fit there. And I'll show a little example of that later on in this session. And with that, I'm gonna have Jeremy take over and show you symbol styles. Okay, <clears throat> thanks Christian. Now definitely, um, the, actually this is something Christian and I have been talking about. How much did you do in code with your visualizations? versus how much should you use web maps and layers. And um, I, th I think it's actually, there's a lot you can do by just using web maps and layers and defining the properties in the map viewer and then bringing, in, bringing them into your app. But um, I'll go, let's go through an example on uh, symbols here. So this was my demo, demo from the Dev Summit Plenary, you know, and I, was, I needed this aha moment about, ah, this is the High Plains Aquifer. And that's the default symbology that the map viewer would give you. Um, and if I pull out to the top, obviously that's, that's not gonna work. So what, what are some things that I can do to sort of um, improve this? If I go into the style options and open up the symbology, you'll see that this current symbol is ta targeted towards basic symbol. That's that basic symbol that Christian talked about. I can control the fill color. Um, I can control the fill transparency. Um, outline color, outline width. Um, we have a few patterns of the lines, but it's pretty basic. 
Um, it's not a, it's, this is not an advanced uh, symbol use case. <clears throat> but um, we, a we actually supply a number of web styles too, uh, which contain those sim symbols that come out of the box. And so there are things like um, particular hatch fills that I could try out. And I have some control over these. Um, or some different kind of texture fills, kind of illustrating landscapes, um, to even like uh, these kind of pencil styles. And you can sort of control the spacing of this um, and uh, how, how random do you want the pattern, how, how, much, how much do you want it to be randomly placed. You have control over all of this, like through these marker pla placement options. Now something that's brand new in the latest release of ArcGIS Online is actually this little plus button right here. This allows you to add styles to your symbol styler. Now what a style is, a web style, is a style of symbols that you, might, that you would offer in Pro, and you can now save that, you can publish it from Pro into ArcGIS Online, and it becomes a style item within ArcGIS Online. Now the symbol styler allows you to uh, select this, so I've got um, styles in my organization. Come on, internet, you can do it. Maybe I should search. Oh, come on. Let's try that again. Okay. Mm, let me try, try Wi-Fi. Oh my gosh. I just deleted it so I could show you how to add it. Uh, let's try one more time. Okay. This is, we may have to bail on this one, Christian. All right. Um, but this is a real bummer because this is the actually good part of it. Let's come I, back. I can I can move on okay. to um, pause, and we'll see um, we'll see this come back. So just put a pin in that. Uh, yeah, symbols. let's put a bookmark in that one. Um, all right. So symbols, basic uh, component of visualization, but we also have a concept of renders. The renders are where I think the real um, not magic happens, but it's like the. Um, where you get the real benefit of extracting, taking raw data and turning it into information that you can actually use and make decisions with. Um, basically, a renderer allows you to tie a data attribute, like a field or an arcade expression, to properties of symbols uh, or colors, and then, and then visualize that so you can see patterns. So we have simple render, that's just showing where things are, everything's visualized the same. But then if you want to visualize numbers, you'd use a class breaks render, or perhaps a, a visual variable, which I'll get to in a minute. Um, but that basically classifies data into categories uh, based off number ranges. You also have unique value render, that's the categorical data. So this example shows the type of highway that, um, or maybe it's jurisdiction, so there's interstates, US highways, state highways, they're colored differently based off a category or a string field. But then you also have other kinds of styles like pie chart render. So if you have um, categories that, or subcategories that belong to a larger one, like demographic data, like you want to visualize the population by different race or ethnicities, or maybe it's the um, educational attainment of uh, different groups. Um, you can also uh, use dot density to do the same thing. This is for polygons where it randomly draws dots within the polygon to show a population density. And then you can color points to show the subcategories, um, such as in this case with educational attainment. Okay, let's pause, because I'm back. <laughs> okay, picking up, picking up where we left off. Okay, 
So I see that somebody in my organization, Russ, has published this outline style. And this is the one I want. So I'm going to add this style to my symbol gallery. And um, I'll see different, um, let me turn this data off. And I'll see some different options here. Of, uh, this case is a polygon, so these are different outline options. And you can see these are definitely complex symbols. There's even this cool lumberjack one here. I think this would be nice, Christian. <laughs> uh, um, that, that would have really made it stand out. Maybe not quite exactly what I was looking for. Uh, so I ended up going with this, this symbol here um, to highlight this high plains aquifer. And it has basically two symbol layers. Uh, one with this kind of uh, this, this lighter purple and a particular size. And then another one with a little bit darker purple. And they're just offset from each other. All that's, that symbol style was authored in Pro shared up to the portal or ArcGIS Online, and then um, from the map viewer, I can go and access those. And that really opens up the types of symbols. There's basically almost no symbol that you can author in Pro that you can't view on the web anymore. And we have a lot of controls over the sim symbology, but not to the full depth of sim symbols. <clears throat> but you can get a long way with just working with kind of the out-of-the-box symbols or um, things that might come through Pro that you might tweak, or John Nelson might create a cool like uh, Tolkien um, Lord of the Rings style, and you can bring that in, and then that, those symbols are already set up to do that type of mapping. So this is a really powerful way, and much, much, much simpler than editing the complex JSON that makes up that sim document that Christian talked about. OK, thanks for being patient. This, this guy right here. There we go, yeah. So, Definitely, you should be using the UI because it's, as you can see, much simpler than having to write out all that code. But of course, wherever the UI doesn't take you, that's where the JavaScript API or SDK can help you. Um, some additional styles. So these these are not um, proper renderer classes per se, but they're, I I think of them as derivative styles from existing ones that we can generate through helper functions um, call, that we call our smart mapping APIs. Um, you can do above and below visualizations, um, age, so the difference between two dates, predominance, what is the most common category out of a group of categories that's think like election data. So if you have columns for Republican, Democrat, other parties, um, this one would look at all of those fields and then map a color to the field that is the winner. Um, and then you have relationship styles. So, um, if, you're, if you've been in cartography or, or made uh, a lot of maps before, you might have um, used bivariate choropleth or at least been seen it somewhere before. Uh, we call it relationship in our SDK, and you can do all kinds of things with not only two variables, but three variables, as we do here, to also vary size. Um, visual variables are pretty important because um, they are an unclassified way to view your data. Uh, I think they're powerful because um, like if you want to vary data by color, like in this example down here in the middle, rather than have, say, four class breaks, you can really show a lot of cool variation in the data um, using an unclassified method. Um, same with proportional size. Um, you change the size of the visual variable based off a of data value, opacity, rotation. This is only works for numeric fields. Um, uh, if you're working with string data, that would fall under the unique value renderer category of styles. So how does a visual variable work? Um, fundamentally, um, you could define it, say, in a simple renderer, and you set that on the renderer property of your layer, and then you set a symbol. So this is the basic simple marker with, it's got a hollow ring um, and pink color. And then you can set a visual variable that says, I want to change the size dynamically based off of this field name, the number of COVID infections on June 1st, 2020. And then there's a stops field that allows you to map a data value to a size. And everything in between would interpolate appropriately, and it gets bounded to the bottom and the, and the top of that. So um, you can see New York has the really large um, value, and then rural counties have much smaller values. You can also use Arcade to define, um, uh, to create uh, 
a, a similar visualization. So if you don't have the column in your table that would allow you to do a data-driven visualization, you could use existing columns to calculate a new value that would then um, execute on render for each of the features and allow you to, um, to map that. Um, what's particularly um, powerful about this is you can actually save that expression to your web map. So if you're pulling in living atlas data um, that you don't own and you can't really calculate new fields on or you have frequently updating data, um, this is a powerful way to just define one expression that every time that map loads or refreshes, it will, it will run and, and allow you to visualize your data however you want to. So in this case, we're just taking, um, we're parsing specific values of uh, the number of infections, because this, this, these columns have um, you know, infections separated by a pipe with the number of deaths that occurred or were reported on that day, um, but, and then it will return a rate. So infections per 100,000, and then you can map those to color values. So it's this nice light blue to deep purple color scheme to show a pattern that you might not otherwise see. Oh, and I just want to point out that when you set the, val the uh, arcade expression, that's on a, the value expression property of the color variable. So this would not be on the field itself. And last thing um, before we hop over and do some more demos is uh, taking a look at, well, I guess there's a couple more slides. Um, you can also do multiple variables. Um, so if I play this animation here, you can create apps that allow you to um, dynamically change the renderer as the user interacts with it. So in this case, as I click show currents, I'm actually adding a size visual variable to the style um, and a rotation variable. So you can see how the current changes as the depth of the, uh, of the water changes too. So there's actually a lot going on in this particular example where you have something like 900 different fields and you're picking a field based off of the user's input and updating the render, and it's very, very fast. So you could play animations that are up to 60 frames per second um, and uh, make them really nice and dynamic. And so then there's this concept of smart mapping. So when you look at some of these examples that I showed before with the COVID infection data, you may look at that and say, well, how did you know to pick those, those hex codes or those color values? And how did you know which breakpoints to set? Um, smart mapping um, helps with that. It, there are these helper functions that we call creator functions. So you see this create continuous renderer method. Um, and basically what it does is it takes in the layer, the view that you're working in, and then you can set a field or an arcade expression, and then it will query statistics for you and take a look at the view background and say, well, this is a light background. We're gonna find a color ramp that's suitable for a light background. And then based off the statistics we query from your data, we'll map those colors to those data points and do it for you. So it's really a good starting point at uh, creating a style. And we also give you uh, UI controls or widgets that allow you to interact with your data. But all of that is built into the map viewer um, in ArcGIS Online. So it's really, um, that's where you should be interacting with smart mapping, though you can use, all of these APIs are publicly documented, you can use them in your own data exploration apps. And finally, there's the concept of symbol size by scale. This is also built into smart mapping um, because it's kind of, it's really hard to get right on your own. Basically, one size does not fit for all scales. So if you look at these, uh, at this example, let me just switch over here. I'm looking at world cities, and these have a value of like two pixels or three pixels maybe in size, these points. And it actually looks pretty good at this scale. I can see a good distribution of my data across the globe. But if the user zooms in, say, to this scale, it is really difficult to see some of this data. So we have a parameter in these smart mapping functions that allows you to change the size by scale. And you can see that they immediately grow because we calculate spatial statistics um, between these points to, to figure out what is the right size that these points should be at this scale. So you'll note that as I zoom in, they're pretty large. And as I zoom out, they will actually progressively shrink down to that size that you saw before. 
And if I open this, you'll see what the size variable that's generated. It basically just says, hey, look at the view scale. And if the scale value is this, make this point size 7.5, and so on and so forth here. So here you can see the effective size of the point. So right now it's at one and a half pixels. But as I zoom in, it will grow all the way up to seven and a half right, to this scale here. So it's a really nice visualization technique because otherwise they either can't see the points or they, they are so large that they overlap and it looks really cluttered. And if you wanted to do it by hand, this is what it would look like on the left. Just set a size visual variable point to the scale like you saw there. You can also target an outline for polygons because sometimes the thick polygons can take over. So you can, you can uh, vary polygon outline width by scale by setting that target to outline. Um, but really this is the, the nice way of doing it is you set the size optimization or this outline optimization parameter to true in smart mapping or you let the map viewer do it for you. And with that, um, Jeremy will show a few demos. Cool. Whoa, that's a totally different color than I see. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, like Christian said, Map Viewer is built on all of those smart mapping functions that he just talked about. And so all of those optimizations, you know, our goal is to give you a good default by default. And so we're, we're using that all over the place. And you can tell with this example of counties, you can kind of see the outlines there. Um, if I zoom in, you know, they kind of stand out. But when I, if I were to zoom way out, notice they'll get fainter and fainter until they're basically gone uh, from the screen. And, you know, all of that just happens by default, but um, we've got this outline, adjust width automatically checkbox and then basically that triggers it. But that's our default, so you get that sort of, you don't even have to think about it, you're gonna get uh, layers where outlines aren't gonna take over your map. Um, I picked this data set because it's, it's kind of interesting. Um, I'm gonna do something like poverty index. And so by default, um, it's gonna recognize that you're dealing um, <clears throat> with non-integer data and going to move to an unclassified uh, choropleth map from low to high. Now these themes um, allow you to explore some of those things that Christian was talking about. So this is using a visual variable, you know, high to low, um, where it's targeting, let's see, let's look at the, where uh, the value of 64 in the data is this value of color, and the value of 152 is this value of color, and everything above it's the same color, everything in between, it varies uh, proportionally. And of course, you can easily switch different uh, color ramps. But all this gets translated into those simple visual variable APIs that uh, Christian showed you earlier. But with themes, we can explore other things like maybe we want to look at it above and below. Um, just that's setting up a, a diverging ramp, picking a good divergent ramp. Um, even the ramps have our um, bias towards the color of the base map to try to give you a good ramp for light versus dark. Um, <clears throat> We can even explore multiple variables. So something like seniors at 65 and children under the age of 14. I think these are la labeled at-risk categories, if I remember uh, right from Jim. Might decide to, um, the default's gonna give you this color and size, where color is driving one of the variables and size is driving the other. But um, since these are counts, there's some interesting things to do. So could explore a dot density of the two, or um, predominant category. Um, and so you can see these areas in red have a higher number of seniors, and the areas in yellow have a higher n uh, number of children. Or let's take the count into effect uh, and do predominance category and size. Uh, so then you don't get biased by you know, looking at areas that don't have a lot of people. Um, we can even do charts. Let's do regular charts here. Charts uh, in, a, in and of themselves to let you explore how that variation between those two categories work together. 
Um, size also takes into a, this uh, sizing comes into play here because we need these to be smaller as you zoom out and bigger as you zoom in. Um, I'm going to switch briefly to the plenary demo. And uh, there we go. Okay, so this is looking at percent change uh, between, um, you know, around 1974 to 2024. And it's doing it through color. But I can also do it through size. And, you know, that's not a super great visual, but I can next use above. So this is going to show me where everything's large and leave everything that's at average uh, be the same value. And of course, you can control this. This is just changing where on the histogram this data value is going to start. But actually, this is a great category for, um, uh, excuse me, a great category for color and size on univariate. So this is using the same data variable to drive size and to drive color. Now, the high to low is not super interesting, but the above and below is pretty, pretty interesting. Now, we've definitely got some outliers here, and so you don't want to let the outliers drive your visual, either you know, fix the outliers or control. But what I think it's worth calling out, let me make this sizes a little bit bigger. is that there's a, there's a lot that goes on in this. So as I move this down, notice how the sizes are changing in that lower one to keep that uh, proportion correct. So an interesting one might be to say, oh, here, let's look at everything that's 200, that gets the biggest, and let's just say um, um, minus 50. Um, and now I'm looking at areas where there's been a huge increase uh, in water usage, so maybe we'll want to flip the colors. So uh, big, large carrots um, are, um, have a high percentage change in loss of water, whereas the blue ones, which there's not that many of, um, have a little bit of an increase. Not a lot, though. But these types of visuals are just so easy to just try. If you were to type all of this in code, you know, you might be like, okay, I finally finished. This looks great. I don't want to touch this anymore. Uh, but the more you can get into sort of getting the right visual with your graphic and then using the tools that get you there faster, um, the, you know, the better time's going to be spent. And I don't have to write any code for this. I can just save this layer or web map and then bring either that layer or the web map into my application and then it's, it's done. Christian, is there anything else you'd like to call out here? No, I just agree 100%. The, a lot easier. Uh, a lot easier. This, one other cool one is that this, comes, this style comes pre-baked with a number of different options for above and below. Uh, so maybe the circles with arrows uh, is the easier to, to visualize, easier to read. And you know, these are just swapping out different symbols. So you really save a lot of time by leveraging these tools that are just right, um, right in the software. Yeah, and you're less prone to missing a comma like I do all the time in my stops and I don't know what I did wrong and so, yeah, for sure. Um, and we put a lot of time and effort, um, probably just as much time and effort into making sure the UI is designed well so that we have good APIs that set it up. Um, but yeah, I'll go through a series of examples too um, with uh, some national park data set because I love national parks. I like wearing my flannels at the national parks, too, <laughs> when I go on hikes and whatnot. But I've um, put together this uh, feature service that contains the visitation numbers from 1904 all the way to last year, 2023. This is the column I just added here for the national parks that are named national parks. I also understand that the National Park Service has 400 something sites that they manage, but this is kind of the, the, the major parks that I'm looking at here as the visitation numbers. So let's go ahead and um, explore this data. And I'm not gonna use the UI here, I'll just show code examples to show the equivalent of what Jeremy was basically showing um, in his examples. So if I just add 
the, uh, let me actually go to my code here. I'm just adding a gray vector base map to my map and adding it to a view. And then um, excuse all the uh, comments here. I'll uncomment that to, to uh, show you what's going on in a second. I'm bringing in this feature by portal item. This is really key because everything that Jeremy showed you, if you get the styling just right for that layer, you can actually save that render or that style to the item itself, and then you don't have to worry about loading that in your code at all, um, or, or writing it out in code. Um, and then you can bring that layer into any application and it maintains that same style. So that's independent of the web map itself. So that's super powerful. Um, I'm just defining a simple renderer with uh, no visual variables and a simple green marker, size eight. That's what we see here. We just see where the parks are, nothing super exciting. So let's, uh, let's add some data to make it a little more exciting. I'm going to vary the size based off of my 2023 column. And because I kind of already have a good sense of how many visits are in the largest national parks versus the fewest, I, I put these numbers in here. But again, if you're using the UI, the statistics queries take over and, and, and help you out a lot by showing you the histogram so you kind of know where to tweak your values. But basically anything that has 10 million or more visits, which there's only one park where that fits, that's Great Smoky Mountains, all the way down to 50,000, and then I'm mapping it to these sizes here. And if I save that, let's hope the uh, inter internet cooperates and loads my data. This is the, the uh, now the data-driven size by park visits. So kind of interesting, not super beautiful by any means, but you can now see kind of a, the variation in, in park data. Um, also note that this is not doing the, vari the varying size by scale, so um, this may work kind of at this range, but not so much all the way out here or even zoomed in. Um, that minimum size is kind of large. I'm gonna go down to eight and try that. That's a little better, I think. Um, so anyway, that gives you one look at the data. You see the total number of visits last year, okay. Well, now let's vary the color by another attribute. This time I wanna show, well, how much did the number in visits change from the previous year, 2022? Well, as you saw from that table, I only have total visits from year to year, so I can use Arcade to help me out. So in this case, I define a value expression, say, give me the value for 2023, subtract it from the previous year, divide it from that year to give me a simple um, change. And I'm gonna give it a nice label here in the value expression title for my legend. And then I can define my various parameters. So I have this color ramp, which is a diverging color ramp. Um, I actually um, got this ramp from the documentation. So if I go um, over here uh, to the styles and data visualization, um, uh, guide. I actually have a QR code at the end of the slides that you can take a picture of to get directly here. This has all kinds of tips and tricks for how to work with different styles and find good symbols and color ramps, including the web styles we already showed you. Those are under this bottom chapter, symbols and color ramps. And then if you click Esri color ramps, we have 512 color ramps available for you to choose from. Um, it's formatted super weird right now. I don't know what's going on there with the screen resolution or something. But anyway, you can um, search for your ramps based off different tags, number of colors. Of course, they should be colorblind friendly. So I can say, well, I want a diverging color ramp, five colors, or maybe seven or wh whatever you want. And then you click search and, or maybe you say, oh, I, I'm working with a light base map. So where's light? Right there and it will constrain it even further, so I only see light colors. And then you can click on this and copy and paste either the hex codes or the RGB values. So that's what I've done in this particular case. And I apply that to my colors, say if it's had a significant drop, it's gonna be a brown color. If it had significant growth of 50% or more, it's gonna be green, and then it interpolates in between. So let's go ahead and refresh and see what we get. So something a little more interesting, we kind of get a, 
uh, we see a little bit of a different of a story. So I guess Yellowstone had a pretty big increase in visits. And that makes a lot of sense because in 2022, they closed for much of the year due to major flooding. So this year, they had a large increase in visitors. Uh, but then you see the southern Florida parks actually had a pretty large decrease. The symbology isn't my favorite still, so we can actually update this. Um, let's take this a step further. And instead of using this simple marker, um, let's do a sim symbol. So I did not type this all out by hand. Um, that would be a ridiculous waste of time, probably. It was all generated or copied from that, um, that symbols and data visualization page here. Oh, sorry, too many tabs. Um, I went to the web styles here and then found my park symbol, which is right here. And then I got to the sim symbol. And the reason I used the sim instead of the web style was because I didn't want this white background with the circle. So I actually copied the sim, found that symbol layer, and just deleted it. Um, and, and that's what is copied in this code here. So if I refresh, I should get a nice tree instead of those circles, OK? And I can enhance this even further, make them pop off the page a little bit by adding a drop shadow effect. So if I'll refresh here, so you see a very subtle drop shadow. I can, I can make that as dark as I want to. I can, like, say black. I just thought the light gray was nice. It might be hard to see on this screen, though. I can't tell. So a little too harsh, in my opinion, but you get the idea. You can, you can make them kind of pop off the screen. Um, oops. Um, there. And then I'm going to add um, just a label that shows the name of the national park as well. So it might, these labels might be pretty small for um, what you guys can see, but you can see the labels pop in there. So just with a, by exploring for a few minutes, I can see different ways that I can visualize that data. Um, I can't get into the internals of uh, these other examples, but I just want to show you just as a means of um, inspiration that, um, let's see here, we did that, is you can, so this uses the above and below that J Jeremy was just showing. Um, it's nice to be familiar with the render APIs in our SDK for apps like this, where you allow someone to interactively look at how data changed over time. So this is the equivalent map of what you just saw, just with different styles, um, using the above and below arrows. You could also um, look at significant years, like 2020, when there was a major drop across the board versus the next year. Um, and then you can have them look at total change versus the total visits. Um, this is just all swapping out field values on every um, slider change. Um, but I think we'll, we'll switch over to the, back to the slide deck to show a few more concepts, and then we can revisit this in the last couple of minutes of the cool. session. Is it that one? Cool. Uh, a little bit about aggregation and density. <clears throat> and we'll have a, it's actually a session focusing on this tomorrow. So. Um, so yeah, when you have lots of features on the screen, how can you turn that into something that's visible or understandable? Um, well, you have control over the drawing order, so you can have the order of the features as they're drawn be driven from some attribute. And you can see the difference that makes. Like uh, here on the left, I've got heavier traffic on the bottom, so we're ordering, we're, we're setting that, um, um, we're setting the order on that features based on the traffic number and saying the bigger numbers should draw first. And you can see the totally different kind of view of that map when you actually draw them on top. Um, so it depends on what's important. Um, with uh, unique value renderers or the type style in the map viewer, you have the ability to uh, order the features based on how they're displayed in the legend. And so if you've got a lot of points that occur next to each other that would get uh, occluded, you can say, hey, I'm going to let the important ones, like the things that resulted in a fatality, uh, pop to the top. And that's just setting an option on uh, the unique value renderer or in the map viewer. Um, there's an option to 
uh, apply the legend order to the sort order of the features, and it can make a huge difference. And there's so many different ways to sort of go from raw data, raw points, to some kind of visual. I can take all those points and just uh, have them all be like 5% uh, opaque, so mostly transparent. And then things that occur on top of each other will uh, show uh, darker patterns, like this second example here on opacity. And things that don't occur a lot will kind of fade away. Um, I can also use heat map. <clears throat> to, uh, to give me that high dense locations, or as I showed in the plenary, ha let it be driven by some data value. Um, or we can cluster the data, or we can bin the data. All of these options are uh, available to you. So that heat map gives you that density as a continuous service. It's actually, um, yeah, it can be dynamic uh, or static, um, and you, meaning you can fix it to a particular scale. Um, we talked about the weighted heat maps when I uh, did that for the Kansas water data to show where their high yield. That's a totally different heat map. Um, you can also still do pop-ups on heat maps. So anywhere the user clicks, you can get all the features that uh, are around where they clicked. Or if you wanted to add key labels, like important data values, uh, that is still possible um, on, the, uh, on a feature layer that's rendered in heat map. Uh, clustering uh, is client-side aggregation that dynamically updates as you zoom, zoom, zoom in and zoom out and aggregates that data in screen space. Um, and then it summarizes those features in the cluster using the layers renderer. Um, <clears throat> and you can also create aggregated fields. Um, and with those aggregated fields, show some summary statistics for about the features that are in the cluster and you can access those in the pop-up to create some pretty interesting visuals. Um, these last two examples, uh, this aggregate fields, is, it's not in map viewer? No, it is in map viewer now. Uh, it is now, yeah. Yes, okay, sorry, dang it. Yeah, okay, so you can do it in map viewer. I was gonna say this is an example where you, want to, you, you could write code, but no, actually, better off. Um, on binning, uh, it's a, it's a fixed bin size, and it aggregates in geographic space, and you can control what bin level you want to uh, aggregate to. Um, and then it you, allows you to create aggregated fields, like I, like I showed in the plenary, um, and then you can access those features in the pop-up. Um, there's a uh, pop-up and a renderer on the aggregated data, and then on the bin data, and then also on the individual features. Uh, just fly through this really quickly. These are some things you can do on top of everything else that we just talked about to uh, you know, make things pop in your map. So they, you can do layer uh, and feature effects. These apply uh, CSS-like filter functions to all features or based on uh, a filter. Um, both Christian and I actually were using examples that use, use drop shadow, so that's a way to let those features stand on top of everything else. But you have full control over uh, a lot of, you have a lot of control over the different types of effects. And, uh, you know, I could use Bloom to do a different type of, uh, uh, it's almost like a heat map actually. Or um, this feature effect allows you to apply a filter, uh, sorry, apply an effect where a SQL expression is true and one where it's false. So in this example here, um, uh, where the borough edge is true, so where the features intersect the boundaries of the boroughs in this uh, place in the UK, um, I'm gonna do a drop shadow on those features and then where they don't uh, match that uh, SQL statement, I'm going to blur them out and apply uh, brightness, uh, lessen their brightness. And so you can see how that allows you to really emphasize certain features in your map. And you, you can do this all in the map viewer too with a simple UI. Um, here's a good example of doing a layer effect um, and then on the using blur to kind of give a little bit of a fuzzy boundary. I think it's good for data sets where you have a little bit of uncertainty. Um, this is a little bit about blending, and uh, start this video here. 
Um, so transparency is something we've always used, right, to try to let the layer, the data below it show. But transparency can sort of, you know, wash out your map. With things like blending, image blending, we can use tools like Multiply to uh, keep the transparency fully opaque, but then let those dark colors of, like, let's say, the hill shade pop through. And so you can get a feel for uh, without, uh, with using Multiply versus not. I mean, that other one is really washed out. It's even more washed out on my, on my screen. And this basically combines the layer on top with the layer below. And there's some high-level uh, blend mode themes. And then each theme has a number of options. It's really easy to just actually get in the map viewer and just cycle through them to find uh, a, a theme that really works. I find myself going back to things like multiply or darken or lighten. Um, or if I'm um, making a, doing something like this, where I want to I wanna actually only add color to where I have pixels, um, doing some of the destination, some of the uh, transparency blend modes, like destination in. So this example is taking two, we see here on the top, this is actual crop land. Uh, and what's on the bottom is county level crop data. And so then we're taking the color uh, and applying it to the individual pixels up here to give you a view of that county level statistical data on top of where crops are actually grown. A um, little bit more on effects. So something like hue rotate can apply the, change the colors of the entire layer um, and do it equally. So I like to do this on some of the out of the box base map styles to get sort of the, the color of uh, that I really want based on the like the antique theme or something. And then I wanted to show one other thing before turning it back to Christian. Um, there's other types of visualizations that you can do that you may not really even think about. So the JavaScript SDK has a media layer, and the media layer allows you to take an image or a, a GIF uh, or even an MP4 video and uh, apply the, if it's geo-referenceable, geo-reference that image or video on top of the map. And so here's, you know, here's an example of a GIF uh, that is showing cloud cover from NOAA, and I got I have a, little, a few controls over that GIF. Here's a data set from NASA's uh, Scientific Visualization Studio, and it's this, uh, let me go here. Uh, internet's not great, but it's playing through this aerosol simulation uh, over time, and NASA actually provides several different views. So one's with uh, like a legend in the, in the video, and uh, one's with out. And you can take those, and that's a sample in the SDK. And well, my internet is, is dying here, but I can then geo-reference that on top of the globe. And then, if, come on internet, you can do it. Yeah, and then have that video play. Uh, directly on top of the map, and I can interact with it. So it's like a totally different, you know, visual, you know, that you're bringing in that's created even outside of any like feature or raster-based data. Like you know, this stuff is created in like a supercomputer, but I can still bring that kind of data into my application. And if you had a better internet, it would flow very nicely <laughs> and not be pausing. <laughs> okay, over to you, Christian. All right, we're actually out of time, so I'm not going to get into the code here. Um, if you do want to get into some of the details about how some of these apps are built, you can find me at the showcase area and the web development area, and we can sit through some, some of these examples. But just to give you some inspiration, that same table that has total counts, um, this is what we ended on last time. I wanted to look at things like, well, what was the record drop in visits in a single year? And so I wrote an arcade expression that finds what the largest drop was between two years. And you can see where that was for each park. And so it's kind of interesting to see how significant it was um, versus for that individual park, but also in comparison to other ones. Um, so you see like Shenandoah, North Cascades had pretty significant drops in particular years. 
Then on the flip side, which park or which year was the most significant in increases for a park? Um, Gateway Arch was the year that the arch was finished or built, was, uh, was very significant for that particular park. And um, the legend, you can see I have nice labels here, that's because on those visual variable stops, I can, there's actually a label property that allows you to provide um, better context as to what something means rather than just a raw number. Um, you can also create dynamic experiences. This isn't like a super pretty example, but it, it's, it's one that can show not just um, the total for that year, but maybe you want to show the 10-year rolling average up to that point and whether or not the trend for the visits into the park was going up or down. So you can see kind of a nice animation of how that changed, how like park visitation dropped in the early 2000s, but then you know, when social media was really taking off, people wanted to go get their selfies, and so everyone went to parks, and, um, and so, like, the, the growth was, was very high. Um, and, um, and in that scenario, um, when you change the slider, basically what's happening is I'm not fundamentally changing the renderer, I'm just replacing the, oop, what's going on here? I'm just replacing the visual variable with the slider value. So the slider value is 2019. So then I go through and just do a templated arcade expression based off of um, that uh, selected year, and I, reach, and I set that back on the render. So in this case, to, to calculate the growth or the trend, I'm calculating the slope between the two uh, values to, in order to, to figure that out. Um, so I replace that in all my variables, and that's what allows uh, me to get this uh, visualization that allows someone to explore the patterns. Um, you could go very simple um, and minimalistic like this, just using um, all black to show the, say, the record number of visits uh, or the year that had the record number of visits at each park. So it's kind of interesting to see this data. Joshua Tree, which is close by to our location, actually had its record high ever just last year with 3.2 million visits, whereas for some parks like Petrified Forest, it's been a long time since they had their record uh, number of visits. Um, this is one I just created this morning because I had the thought while I was going through, well, what are the visitation numbers today compared to pre-pandemic levels? And so that's what this one shows is parks that are red are parks that have not, not quite reached um, the level of visitation as they got pre-pandemic, which was 2019 and those few years um, ahead of time. So Grand Canyon, um, if I look at the chart here, you can see how it had 6.3 million visitors in 2018, and then 2020 it dropped all the way down to 2 million, and it hasn't quite, it's kind of sloped off, hasn't quite had the same number. So you can get very creative with Arcade and showing different patterns and stories that come out of your data. Um, let's actually check out the Alaska parks, because some of these, yeah, still haven't quite recovered, but other ones like Glacier Bay, this one relies on cruise ships to come through. So of course when pandemic hit, they shut down and had a huge drop, but now they're back in full force. People are going to visit the park there. Um, so that is the last example I wanted to show off. Um, again, I can show you code in the arcade behind it at the showcase if you're curious. Um, but I wanted to finish by giving you this QR code. This gets you to that data visualization guide. So that contains all those 500 plus color ramps, all the web styles, not only that, but um, tips and tricks and uh, on how to work with outlines, sizes, um, whether to use classed visualizations or unclassed, the continuous gradient versus classification. Um, things of that nature to, to really help you become more confident in styling your data. And um, please share your feedback about the session on the app. Let us know if our content was relevant to you and your work and um, if Jeremy and I uh, did okay as presenters, let us know so we can make modifications as necessary. And um, of course, social media. Um, but that's all we had today, so I think we have zero minutes for questions, so maybe one or two um, questions. Yes? Say that again? So you have the auto scaling 
Mm -hmm. Right. Okay, so the question is um, whether I added the dollar view scale to the code for the auto scaling. Um, yes, so um, I did that in my example where I added that size visual variable that is based off of that. It's an arcade expression, it's just dollar view scale is the whole expression. And then I had to choose view scales and mapped those. So I added that manually, but what Jeremy was showing is you don't have to do that with the UI. It just comes out by default when you're styling your data. So you can either do it that way or call a smart mapping function because understanding what those scale values are is really tedious to work with. It's data driven too, yeah. So it depends on the data. Yeah. So definitely, yeah, use the map viewer. All right, any others you guys can come on up, but thanks a lot. Yeah, thanks for coming out.